thank you. I, thank you very much. And thank you for the honor of having been invited. And I'm happy uh, to talk to you today. I'm not sure whether I'll be entertaining, but I hope I'll stimulate a bit of thought. Um, the topic is the, the dilemma we are currently in, because all these solutions which are currently being proffered. OK. Um, the current alternatives don't promise a solution to the problems we are facing. But policymakers don't want to move. And I think I want to, based on that insight, I want to suggest that we at least think about alternatives. Now, let me go. The first thing is that we are always told travel behavior doesn't change. Now, that's an obvious nonsense. And if anything has shown that travel behavior changes, is the forced changes we had during COVID. This is the results of a large GPS tracking-based panel which we had in Switzerland uh, during the pandemic. And you can clearly see on the red line, which is the line for 2020, uh, the drop-off during uh, the lockdown, the relatively mild lockdown in Switzerland. So there was forced change. But I think the most Im more important message is that we're ongoing change. When you compare the blue line, which is the before period, and the after periods. And you can clearly see there was a reduction in the share of people leaving the house uh, for by about 5%. Doesn't sound a lot, but when you remember that only about 70% of people work, 5% is a lot more. So what we are seeing here is the ongoing impact of working from home and related behavioral change. So behavior does change. And we have to bank on that for any policy we want to introduce to cope with the climate challenge we have and obviously all the normal transfer problem, i.e. congestion, etc. And the other thing which is interesting that the Swiss didn't care about COVID in their behavior. Now, so what is the dilemma I am stipulating to exist? I think the key point about it, the starting point, is transport is a normal good. The cheaper we make it, the more we consume of it, i.e in person kilometers or in ton kilometers. And because this is so, all policy which makes travel cheaper doesn't help us to address the congestion problem, doesn't help us to address the CO2 problem. And we have to admit this to us and then act on it. But I would argue we as a society and the politicians we elect haven't allowed that self to admit that. Now, when you remember this, it is no surprise that over the last two and a half centuries, policymakers have done everything possible to make travel cheaper. Why did they do that? Because they understood intuitively that if we want to become richer, we have to allow societies to become work and produce at a higher scale, and work and produce with higher degrees of specialization. If you have and do that, you have to increase the market size to sell your products. You can't hope to be able to place all the products in a tiny market. That doesn't work, or hasn't worked, at least in the two, last two and a half centuries. Now, to achieve that, to make that market larger, what did we do? We increased what I call fleet comfort here, i.e. we added the numbers of vehicles and we made them more comfortable, safer, and faster. And we have done that with the vengeance, whether for public transport or for private transport. The other thing which we did to allow these vehicles to move, we built slots. We built technical infrastructure which allowed us to move at the desired speeds. And that's the history of the last 100 years, where around the world we have added motorways and railways to move the people. <coughs> There's an unfortunate byproduct of us getting richer, which is that we become more impatient. 
And there's a pretty robust results which show that making you richer makes you more impatient as measured by the value of travel time savings. And that also keeps politicians active to make sure that we can at least travel at the same speed, ideally at higher speeds. Now, what happens when you make travel cheaper? You allow the market size to grow because products can be moved. And if the market is larger, no surprise, you get more ton kilometers and person kilometers. And the only negative feedback is that the speed at which we build the slots is normally slower than the speed by which we add kilometers. That's the congestion feedback. Now, having said that, I will come back to that. So the basic assumption is we want to become richer, and by be becoming richer, we have to travel more. And we want to travel more. Now, to show that, there is a nice study we did with Switzerland where we calculated the travel times in Switzerland for the roads in 1950 between every municipality in the country. And then we rescaled the map to be read as a time map. So you see the scale, you can measure out how long it took in 1950 to travel any two places in Switzerland. Now, that's not impressive, although it is for its own right. What is really impressive if you compare it to 1950? This is the same scale. We shrank the country by a factor of two, by building motorways, by building and buying faster cars, and modernizing the system. We did similar things on the railways, not quite as extensive, but comparable. And the other thing which happened in Switzerland, I'm pretty sure you would, could produce similar numbers for other countries, is that the Swiss travel more. Here is the average person kilometers traveled in the country since 19, 1990, 94, uh, per head, as measured by the National Travel Diary Survey. And you can see that those numbers consistently increased, but for the dip of the COVID impact of the most recent uh, National Travel Diary Survey. So the Swiss responded as theory would expect us for them to behave. They wanted wealth. They invested in the, t in the time slots. They had more money to travel, and they did. Now, it's obviously very difficult to get people who have had this experience for the last 50 years, or maybe for the last 250 years, to get out of that habit and out of those expectations. So now what is the dilemma? Why are we worried? It has worked for two and a half centuries. Let's continue. And if you look at the Chinese, if you look at the Indians, they would say, oh, yes, we have to continue this. But we know it has problems. Now, we do know from lots and lots of empirical results that this indeed actually makes us more productive and therefore also richer in those countries where the income distribution kind of still works. It also, and that hasn't been measured as well, helps us to increase our social capital because to maintain our social capital we have to see each other and if we live in a higher accessible environment the chances to reach other people are higher, and we make use of that. And I guess in Belgium as well as in Switzerland, leisure travel makes up about 40% of all trips and 40% of all miles traveled. Now, we have a couple of problems with this. One is that we design the number of slots for the peak, which leaves us with lots of unused capacity in the off-peak which then invites even further and more travel, which is by design. We then also have the problem that the current policy which we are thinking about to get to grips with the climate problem is first and foremost electric vehicles, which are great, but from a transport view, they are a bad idea because they make travel cheaper. In the long run, electric vehicles will produce lower costs than current 
elect, uh, 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 normal cars, current cars, so we will have even more incentive to travel more. And therefore, if we don't build the slots, more congestion. If we add automated vehicles, it will be worse because automated vehicles will make travel even more comfortable and we would expect even more travel. Never mind that all the people who currently can't travel but suddenly are allowed to travel. So we have a problem. And then we have now gloriously recognized the value of working from home, but working from home reduces the incentive to commit to public transport. So by a season ticket. So we would expect relatively less travel by public transport, therefore making all of our travel problems even worse. Now, why are we worried about all of this? We are worried about all of this because we want to reduce CO2. And in Switzerland, like in many other European countries, we have clearly committed ourselves to reach CO2 goals, which are very ambitious in 30 years, not even 30 years, it's now 27 years, or a couple of years more, depending how you count. And anything which moves produces CO2. So we are not going to reach those targets. In Switzerland, we have made it quite explicit that we don't want further sprawl. And again, anything which makes travel easier invites sprawl. So we have a problem. And then we have congestion, as before. Now, for policymakers, it's really difficult because the policymaker knows the country wants to get richer, which means investing in making travel cheaper. But at the same time, he has all the other elements which he has to consider. So this is a true dilemma, and we have to find solutions to that. There is, as a side problem, uh, that in urban areas, policymakers face the situation that the capacity of the city is more or less fixed. Uh, students of ours, uh, Monica Menendez and myself, did a lot of empirical work to predict the capacity of an urban area measured through the macroscopic fundamental diagram and then try to explain the size of that capacity as a function of juncture density, lane miles, between the centrality, a measure of the chances of uh, congestion, and bus mile density. And you can predict that. And if you look at those variables, you can see how expensive they are to change. So for the policymaker in urban areas, faces a more or less constant capacity on top of everything else. Now, what to do in this situation? I will come back in a minute to currently discussed solutions. But let us go back and think about how policy was driven in the last 100 years by a couple of very specific visions. And to remind ourselves of those, let me show you some. This was uh, Le Corbusier's idea of how to solve the problem of the highly congested, dirty, and unpleasant city of the 19th century. He decided, just get rid of it. I think he wanted to leave of Paris maybe a couple of churches, but that was about it. And in his grandiose plans, he also wanted to add airports right between the buildings. Uh, now, I don't say that anything was built exactly like this, but this idea of the tower and the park has been incredibly powerful in designing urban areas around the world. Go to Singapore and you see a cut down, reasonably priced version of this. At the same time, another more or less underemployed architect, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, came up with Ozonia, which was his idea to provide every American with an acre of land, a house on it, and obviously a parking space, um, to solve the urban problem. And again, this vision was incredibly powerful, because even today, well, especially today, this is what most people in the industrialized world still want to have. They want an acre, 
they want a house on it, and they want two parking garages, probably three parking spaces by now. And obviously lots of roads to get them away from it. Then there was a further vision, which was more uh, addressed to how to rebuild uh, the urban area. There, was, there were two very important reports in the 1960s. One was led by Professor uh, Colin Buchanan, or who became Professor Colin Buchanan, and then by Professor Reuben Smead. Uh, and they too studied the alternatives at the time. One was road pricing, and the other one was to rebuild the cities and actually add capacity, add slots, by removing the pedestrians from the ground level and just giving it over to cars. And Colin Buchanan and his team got these very v important visualizations made, which are still hovering around in the backs of British and other policymakers' minds. Just get rid of the pedestrians, just build roads. Now, in Germany, uh, they kind of came up with the idea of a, a city ready for cars, autogerechte Stadt, which in German has this uh, connotation of being suitable for the car and being just, just the right thing. In this case, this is suburbia where they wanted to build uh, what has been built in thousands of cases around the world, a suburban development with just one access road to the main road, and then going from there. And otherwise, more or less, a cut-down version of Isonia. Uh, in Germany, they couldn't think of providing everybody with 4,000 square meters, so a bit fewer for the houses. And then, obviously, this vision, which is still glorious, isn't it? Sunshine, empty road, just one car, you and your car can drive at any speed you like. That's heaven, isn't it? And why? because this is heaven, it is still what people want. Now, these dreams were incredibly powerful. And I think to move us really forward, we have to come up with visions which are equally strong. And some of the visions which are around are equally strong, but highly unliked, unloved. Now, what is currently being discussed? We discuss a couple of futures. Let me go through them. One is obviously dear to the heart of the economists and other engineers is, oh, we just manage it, and we manage it properly, and the problem will go away. And to show you what an economist would do if he was a dictator, he would price everything which moves. Uh, he would have a two-part tariff uh, for infrastructure. One is to pay an option fee that it's there, and then let them pay a pay-as-you-go for usage. Then there would be congestion pricing to get rid of the externalities of congestion. Then you would add demand-responsive parking pricing so that you have no parking surge. You would then price all the greenhouse gas emissions at appropriate prices, and then whatever local emissions you have as well. And then, from an engineering point of view, you have solved the problem. Now, the problem is that it's hated by the public. And there has been no city in a democratic world where you got approval for it. Not quite true, you would say. Think of London. OK, London got it in because the mayor needed to have a program. And because his mayor, mayor's office had, could only really do work on transport, because all the other policy areas were still in the hand of somebody else, he got road pricing in London approved and implemented at vast expense. Stockholm got it approved because they didn't allow the people who were against it vote on it. Uh, because they only allowed the people inside Stockholm vote on it. And for them, it was a good deal. But all the suburbanites were not allowed to vote. And you 
probably know how difficult it was to get this done in New York, and it was only really after lots and lots of fights that they finally got something which is kind of okay. So it's not an option which I think put much hope in. Then obviously, mobility as a service will solve all problems. I'll come to that in a minute. Just to show you the potential of uh, mobility pricing, uh, these are results from a recent study finished in 2019, the empirical work, uh, where we estimated the willingness of people to change behavior uh, to a pricing signal. Uh, it was a virtual study, and lo and behold, pricing works. Uh, this, these are results from Beat Hintermann, the economist I worked with. And if you just look at the total external cost as, and the response to it, we got a statistically significant behavioral change. The implied elasticity is about minus 0.3. So it's there, but it's not massive. And then there was an information treat and blah, blah, blah. There were differences. But the key message is it works. And there's no doubt it works. And if any politician tells you it doesn't work, just show him these results and all the others. It works. Now, one of the issues we have, in particular for shifting car drivers away to more environmentally friendly modes, is there is a huge gap in the generalized cost of travel between traveling by car and traveling by public transport. What I show you here is the ratio between the co generalized cost of public transport use versus car use. We estimated these based on the Mobis GPS tracking data. And you can see that the ratios are massive. Above uh, the is travel um, with season ticket. So people have a season ticket at hand. We earlier, there was a session about free public transport. It's equivalent to that. When they have public season tickets, they the cost differentials as experienced is only about one to one. So if you know, this only implies a mode share of about 50% for public transport. Better than today, but not nearly good enough. If you look at the full cost, which is the, the full lines below, the ratio is about 0.5. So public transport is about twice as expensive as private transport for about the whole distance range. And that shows you the height of the hurdle which any system has to overcome. So it's going to be extremely difficult to move people into public transport. And all we know from all the experiments of making public transport cheap is we get people shifting from the other environmentally friendly modes and relatively few people shifting from the car. And we see lots of induced demand. People just travel more. So not good. Then there's the whole point of automation. I think the hype around automated cars kind of multiplying the existing capacities in urban areas have gone away by mostly now. So automated vehicles will add capacity, but at reasonable shares, maybe 40, 50% more uh, to the urban capacity, but it's no, not a breakthrough. And then on top of it, it will invite lots and lots of extra travel. What we did here, uh, our PhD students did in my group, they calculated the cost of uh, per person kilometers uh, of automated vehicles of various form. For private automated vehicles, for automated taxis, and then for city bus. The cost level is about one third less than current costs in Switzerland. So that gives you an an idea of the expected growth, which just comes from that. But on top of that, the hope that we can get everybody into an automated taxi and therefore reduce the fleet size, if not 
the, the, the miles driven is also very dubious because if you have an automated taxi which has to recover its full cost of operation, so we don't assume that they are going to be subsidized, they will be about as twice to three times as expensive as the marginal cost of travel in the private automated vehicle. And we do know that today people only look at the variable cost. So the variable cost will make an automated vehicle always more attractive than a taxi, never mind all the other benefits you have. So it's unlikely that we're going to get people into automated taxis, never mind pooled taxis. Then, obviously, we can hope for, for a world where we have both electrical and autonomous, autonomous vehicles, but will it get us there? Um, one of my students prepared that for the project I'm just going to talk about, and this is the CO2 output. This is for Switzerland. Uh, what can we expect to get? So today's combustion engines, if you replace them all by electric vehicles, yes, you get a 20% reduction in CO2. Uh, if you then assume that the vehicles will be more effective, you get 62% less, great. But then you have population growth in Switzerland. You then have to add the induced demand effects. Then you have to add the induced demand effects of autonomous vehicles. And then you're up again ab above the target by some distance. So in my analysis, yes, we want electric vehicles. We might want autonomous vehicles. But they're not going to s solve the CO2 problems. So it's no surprise that we are not alone in this analysis. Many people come to the same conclusion uh, that technology will not save us. OK, technology still might save us, but none of them at the horizon seem to be able to deliver the results till 2050. Uh, I'm happy to be corrected, but uh, at least that's the feeling at the moment. So. The argument is, get rid of cars and reduce their use, in particular in urban areas. So there are various versions of this um, which are currently being discussed. The 15-minute city, the net zero city, all of those are being discussed, although very often they leave it unclear of how they want to get there. The 15-minute city is obviously particularly prominent because the colleagues in Paris have done a very good job of marketing it and having tempting visions of Parisian streets without cars. Now, the problem with Paris and all the other rich cities is that they're rich cities. And therefore, they can work at high densities with lots of spending money to maintain the services which make a city desirable. Now, what will happen when you do that in a place which is neither rich nor dense? It's unclear. Now, we have come up in Zurich with an idea which says, OK, what do we do? We need to get rid of the car as much as we possibly can. But we want to deliver accessibility. We want, want to allow people to travel and get to see the people, get to work, get to wherever they need to, walk, need to go. And one thing which hasn't really been as prominent in these discussions is that the e-bikes, in principle, deliver speeds comparable to cars at vastly lower CO2 impact, with a bit of health impact as well, positive health impacts as well. Now, the question is, can we rebuild the city to make it work for the e-bike? But it's not only an e-bike city, but it's an e-bike, bike, public transport, and walking city. E-bike city for short. Can such a city work? And I think that's really the issue we want to address. Can this alternative work? We don't know whether it will work, but we want to find out how far we can get. To do that, 
we have kind of teamed up uh, in a team in Zurich uh, involving six other chairs. Uh, Michel Belair has joined us as well from Lausanne, and I hope that many other people will join us as well to work at this and the many, many technological and design issues which arises when you do that. Because we said, we know people don't like to cycle because it feels unsafe. And it feels unsafe because there's not enough space for cycling. So we said, just give them 50% of the road space, just as a starting point. Then make sure that you maintain the accessibility, and you clearly make sure that you maintain car accessibility because people still need to move in cars. The ill, the sick, the package, whatever it is which you can't move on a, car, on a bike, you still make sure that people can get to their address by a car. And then you want to make sure that you integrate the shared services, whatever they are, public transport, pool vehicles, in a proper way and that they can cope with the larger demand variations because we do know people still don't like to cycle in the rain or some people don't like to cycle when it's minus five. So we have started to look at that and we have uh, asked the question, okay, you have an existing road and what happens when you take one lane away? And that means we have to really go through a design exercise to find out how such a city could look like. Where do you put the, the bike lanes? What do the junctions look like? How do you cope with the curbs? There's lots and lots of hard engineering, hard in the sense of hardware, questions you have to answer. And then there are plenty more questions uh, which arises. How do you deal with the emergency vehicles? We still want to get to the hospital after a heart attack and not wait too long. Uh, what do you do with suburbia? Uh, what do you do with the speed differentials within that slow mode category? Because you have the problem that you have pedestrians at about five kilometers, four kilometers an hour versus an e-bike traveling up to 45 kilometers an hour, uh, the fast ones. You don't really want to mix them. Is there enough space? How do you manage them? How do you keep them under control so that it doesn't become a complete disaster? Um, what do you do with the parking, both for the cycles as well as for the residual cars? Um, how do you integrate public transport properly and appropriately? What do you do with long distance cycling? What infrastructure do we have to provide for them? Uh, what are the, uh, the parking and how do you manage that for cycles? Because cycles are something which uh, people love to steal, and because e-bikes are pricey, you have to do something above and beyond that, current things. Then there's sharing on top of that um, as well. Then there's obviously lots and lots of theoretical and design questions which you have to address. So what is an optimal pattern of, of the one-way streets you get after you have done this? What, is the co what does it cost to reconstruct all of that? You want to know how current e-bikers behave to kind of predict what might happen when they become uh, large numbers. Um, what is the future mode uh, choice in such a city? How do you model the adjustment of the schedules of us after we have to rely on e-bikes? We're not going to behave just like we do today, okay, short of the people who move around just walking. Then. What are the CO2 impacts of that? Um, are the current LCA numbers appropriate? Do we need to correct them uh, as far as we know? What are the future accessibilities? Will they really match current levels? And then there's obviously questions. How do you manage freight in such a city? And what is, are the road safety impacts? Because you might have heard that e-bikes are currently causing lots of accidents for the elderly users who, for the first time ever, cycle again and then are surprised how bloody fast these e-bikes are. <coughs> so what do we have to do all of this work? Um, for Switzerland, 
We have, with Matsim, an agent-based model for the whole country, which has been calibrated, so it provides us a starting point for all of our modeling work. There's also a national aggregate model, which has been developed by SPB, which we have access to, which has been supported and added to by Michel Biller's group. We have MFD-based approaches to speed up the calculation of equilibria and new flow conditions. Uh, uh, Ludovic Leclerc has done work which will be the basis of that. We have lots and lots of data which we are happy to share. Uh, we have the data from Movis and Movis COVID. That's about 750,000 track days. We have EBIS, which is an ongoing study. We have about 350,000 um, track days. And we have Time Use Plus, which adds time use information for about 36K of data. All of that is worked on by a team, um, which I show here, um, the PIs as well as the project coordinator, uh, Clarissa Livingston, and all of the current PhDs and postdocs who are involved in this project. And with that, I'm looking forward to your complaints. And sh please shout at me if I'm completely stupid. Thank you for this very stimulating talk. Uh, now at your just uh, your starting point, I think I do not understand why, uh, let's say, electric cars do not solve CO2. If you have sufficient renewable energy, and actually uh, that's something I think we envisage, uh, envisage uh, that's something actually what we foresee in Europe. My second point is that, um, Actually, uh, sprawl in the city is not the issue if you go to, uh, let's say, a lot of climate change. What you will need is a city that has much more green areas, is much better protected against uh, warm conditions. So it really leads to a very different type of city. And then, of course, I could argue that road pricing could work, and actually, <laughs> but I, I leave it to that. Thank you. I think road pricing does work. There's, nobody doubts that. It's just getting a majority for it. And in the Swiss case in particular, everything like that has to win a popular referendum. And at this point, I don't foresee a future where the 780 per thousand car owners will vote for it as a majority. Um, then your point about the electric vehicles is an important one, but th th some of the recent LCA numbers show that it's not going to be good enough. Yes, it will help, no doubt, but I think the numbers I saw, but I'm happy to be corrected, show that it doesn't, it's not enough. Now, your point about that suburbia is actually good for a hot city, I think is a fair point. Yes, you want to be out uh, and get enough air between the buildings to allow to temper the temperatures. Fair point. But the Swiss, maybe before they really caught on to the impact of the heat waves, which will come, voted on restricting further urban sprawl. And against that, that's a policy constraint in the Swiss context. Now, I do know that the Belgians love their suburban houses, many of those, and as much as they possibly can. So maybe the situation is different here, but in the Swiss context, it's a constraint. In, in all your analysis, 
I, I miss a kind of, I don't know, maybe I should call it the elephant in the room, but it's actually the car parked in the city. Actually, when I, it's just a, 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 an anecdote, but maybe it helps to explain. I saw, you, there are many, many uh, old pictures of streets, how they were used, like say 50, 60 years ago. And when you look at the axis, the axis of, of the, the road size, often it is, it's not that different for say, let's say 1930 or 1950 or even now. But what you see, at least in Belgium, I don't know how it is in Switzerland, but we love our parking spaces so much. If you look at how much space is go devoted in cities to parking space, I actually think you don't need to have that many less access roads. You need to have less parking. Sorry, I didn't make it explicit. Um, I think parking is one of the areas where, certainly in Switzerland, somewhat more rational policies are taking hand. So pricing is kind of getting approximately demand-led. Uh, the number of parking spaces which have to be provided uh, but with new development are being reduced or completely omitted. So there, they are not adding to the Im immense stock of parking. But getting rid of existing parking is still politically extremely hard. And for that reason, in our planning, in our design ideas, you see no parking spaces here. Um, and we are very well aware that we have to provide uh, parking and stopping places for deliveries and uh, craftsmen and the occasional, hopefully only occasional ambulance. Uh, but we are not really, in our design, provide the same amount of parking as before. Thank you. So fantastic presentation, Kai. Um, you mentioned something very important about pricing. Indeed, it's a politically charged topic uh, and very unpopular and very difficult to make it pass. But I actually wonder whether electric vehicles can be the solution somehow. And I'm referring to electric vehicles in a different way from the previous colleague comment. I'm referring to the fact that electric vehicles make one thing that we are used today obsolete, which is the gasoline tax. And many countries around the world are thinking about how to replace gasoline tax. And the way at least the United States and other countries are really thinking to go is to replace the revenues from the gasoline tax with a user base fee. There will be like, you know, vehicle miles travel or whatever way we want to call it, road user charge, etc. So that's set the infrastructure. Once we have a way to charge people per mile or per kilometer to drive their car, that actually opens the door to many other applications. We can do dynamic pricing by the day, congestion-based pricing, location-based pricing, occupancy-based, etc. Do you think that opens the door to solving the problem and making people accept pricing somehow? And by the way, side comment on the uh, suburbia. Uh, with climate change, there's also drought uh, and that is coming and more sprawl actually requires more water, which is a problem also in warm weather. So. I th uh, well taken point. Um, the question is how this will be implemented. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, the ministry or the highway administration is currently pushing uh, for a replacement. But in the discussion of mobility pricing, they, or more precisely, the government decided that the level of the pricing will never rise above the current level of pricing, which makes it very difficult to get any dynamic charging element in there. Um, and then, at the end, it still has to get approval by, the re by referendum. And it's very easy to mobilize the people against it because the claim is they will charge more you will have to be identified personally. You have to be tracked individually, wherever you go. And 
that still is a very, very hard fight to win. So I can't predict what will happen uh, and how it will happen, but maybe in the end they will just have a system which will measure how many kilometers you have traveled inside the country or inside a particular local authority area and then charge you accordingly. And then don't raise it. And then maybe as an aside, in Switzerland the car tax as such is, is paid and raised by Canton in each of the 26 local government areas inside the country. And there are a couple of those cantona where referenda to raise this tax were lost in the last two decades. So the hope of getting rid of it and then introducing a new charging regime <sighs> opens up the issue that the voters decide to get rid of it completely. Hi, okay. uh, thanks for your presentation. So I have a question about the e-bike city. So how do we define it? So how many percentage people using e-bike could be defined as e-bike city? And also it is possible, I think, uh, because I did some research regarding the trail behavior in small Chinese cities, uh, we find that around 50% uh, people use e-bike for commute. So I think e-bike could be more uh, practical and uh, possible ways in small cities context. And uh, yeah, so I, I was wondering what is the target group for the e-bike use in, in your research? I'm happy to hear that the Chinese still cycle um, <laughs> because when you look at the big cities, um, a few of those are still around. Um, no, all the better. Um, yes, smaller cities obviously make cycling much more realistic given that the distances aren't that large. But I'm talking about European cities which generally don't have the scale of the big Chinese conurbations. I'm not, let's say, I think in Europe the only cities where size really becomes an issue is kind of Paris, uh, London, maybe Berlin. Uh, so I think all the European cities are small cities by that definition. Uh, then the question is who, who's going to cycle? Um, we will find out. Um, cycling is something which the Dutch clearly demonstrate you can do till you're 100. If you are used to it, you can continue to do that. And if you're supported by an electric motor, you can do it even longer. Uh, so the question becomes, will people respond to that change in the environment? Will that really get enough people out of their cars? And at this point, I'm afraid that our results will show that probably not enough people are willing to shift. And we will probably have to adjust the, the choice models and say there has to be some deus as machina, some change in culture and miraculously it works. Um, but we aren't there yet, so we don't know how big this uh, intervention from heaven has to, will have to be. Questions from my side? Hi, Kai. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Really nice, a lot of food for thought. At the beginning, you actually have been uh, showing this graph on uh, what happened during the pandemic and then the new normal and the work from home. I was wondering whether you have actually already some indication of how much uh, productivity changes with work from home because one of the things that you said at the beginning is we need to move because we want to make activities and that's something that we know it's positively correlated to being richer and richer. But is this actually happening also with shifting to work from home? So are we actually seeing a reduction of production because of that? Th first thing. And the second, maybe you don't need to answer that, 
Do you think that if you make a referendum in Switzerland saying we are going to get rid of one half of your road capacity, they will say yes instead of paying for roads? I doubt that. Uh, I think the the work from uh, the impact of working from home uh, will depend very much on the induced demand effects of working from home. And um, now during COVID, we can do with the data we have, we can do some of the analysis. And yes, we saw some absolute reduction in the mileage, but not completely uh, for the foregone commuting trips. Uh, but we have to repeat and intensify that analysis that hasn't really been properly done. Um, then we are doing further work on working from home because the analysis has been a bit simplified at the moment because I think you have to ask three questions. How many people are allowed to work from home? How many people can work from home without going crazy? And how many people want to work from home? And you have to ask all three questions to get an idea of the total impact. There's a study ongoing, it's I think in the field, so I'll be able to tell you more about that. Now, your point about can we get a population to vote for pricing by suggesting the alternative is the e-bike city is an interesting one. I think the Swiss referendum system is normally worked and phrased in a way that you have to vote on these issues independently. So it's very likely that you get two no's. Thanks. Thank you very much. In the interest of time and the events later, I want to thank our excellent speaker again for the amazing presentation. So